So, hi everybody. Um, today I'm going to talk about the two scalable and modular systems that I built and the lessons that we learned from it. So, um, to begin with, machine learning has been impacting all of our lives. I think that's one reason why all of you come to this conference. In many aspects, for example, it improves our online advertising. It, it's everywhere in our lives and it helps you to do scientific explorations like analyzing the data from large hydrogen collider. And on the, on the center of the machine learning algorithms, the real center is the, this is machine learning systems that helps you to, be, to scalably analyze the data that you have and being able to push your ideas into production. So today I'm gonna to talk about two systems that I built in the past. Um, that, that's going to solve, I, I would say, uh, almost all the possible kind of problem that you can expect because normally the practical machine learning algorithm that you can use in, in practice is not, that, it's not a, that, that, that a lot. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is, uh, is, a, is a system that's going to solve half your problem. So normally if you look at the data that you have, um, if your data is tabular data, which means that if the data pull, can be pulled out from database or any, any possible like data frames that you have, tree-based method is a great way to solve those problems. And uh, uh, among all the possible tree-based algorithms, actually boost is the algorithm that uh, many of the data scientists used and uh, actually used to win the state-of-art state competitions in those data science competitions. And, uh, and this is the first system that, uh, that I'm going to talk about today. So actually we've been around for a couple of years for now and uh, I'm sure that some of you have used it. So I'm not going to talk about the old details, I'm only going to give an update about what are the new stuff that we have in there. So actually Boost is great and it's getting better. Uh, there are three things that, that you, you might haven't noticed but it's already in the main branch that, that I think is exciting. Uh, one of the first thing that's, that's new is that XBoost now support this kind of function called monotonic uh, functions that, are, that allows you to place monotonic constraints on input and output. For example, if you want to predict the price of your house, you would likely want your price of a house to be monotonically increasing according to number of squares in the house. Otherwise, uh, you, will, you, will, you, will, you, will, you wouldn't be satisfied with the prediction. There are other such, there are a lot of cases that that have this use, use case that requires monotonic constraints. So um, we support monotonic constraints automatically so that you can place the monotonic constraint that you want and the model will, will preserve that constraint and, and it, will, it will work perfectly for your purpose. Of course, we'll talk about the actually boost, one of the most important things you want, the training to be faster. It's already the fastest algorithm that you can have uh, in, to do gradient boosting and it's actually getting faster. So we are, we are adopting a new histogram-based algorithm that can give you more than 10 times speed up using single-threaded and is, with multi-threaded version is a, a bit slower but still it gives you like uh, four to seven times. So that's a great option that you can try and gives you far, even, even better speed up. Uh, finally, there's a new GPU-based module that if you, are, if you have a GPU, then it's likely that you can use it to give you another four times speed up. Uh, in, and and there, there's a combination of the GPU module and the histogram-based method that I talked about that's announced in this year's GTC, and we'll be pushing it together with NVIDIA so that uh, it's, uh, this new module will give you even better speed ups, speed ups uh, with GPU. So that's all for the action boost, and uh, I'm going to focus the rest of the time of the talk on a second system that I built. So I've talked about that. There's, there's like one method, one toolkit that can solve half your problem. So, so you have another half of a problem that usually, uh, okay, so, so last thing. So when, when you talk about XBoost, I think one of the most, most important thing that usually uh, isn't talked a lot about in ac academic is that uh, you, don't, you don't only want your method to be accurate and, uh, and useful, you want your system to be portable and modular. In a sense that uh, uh, if, you are, if, you, if you are building a, a production system, usually you already have some existing systems in your, in your production environment, for example Hadoop or Yarn or some in-house distributed system that you have. 
and you don't want to directly kill that your old system and, and port, it, port that to a new machine learning, whatever machine learning product that others want to sell to you. So Actibus adopts another philosophy called Unix philosophy. So instead of trying to build an entire platform that solves everything, we try to build a, a modular module that you can plug in into arbitrary languages and the arbitrary platform. For example, currently Actibus supports Scala, Python, C++ interface, and, uh, and R interface. So you can, you can run those an, 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 an analytics in arbitrary language that you have. And we have a distributed module that can be directly plugged into existing distributed systems like uh, Flink, Spark, and other in-house distributed systems. So that uh, whatever system you have, you can directly take Actibus module, put it in there, and interpret uh, with the existing data processing platform and other, other systems you have. So modularity is actually one of the most important thing, in my opinion, in designing all those scalable deep learning systems, uh, scalable machine learning systems. So this brings the second half of uh, second half of my talk and another system. So if you want to talk about uh, machine learning, solve all your problems. Tree-based model solve half a problem. Another half problem is going to be solved by deep learning. So uh, that's a simple rule that to to, to go like. If your data is tabular, try tree-based math first. If your data is images, audio, speeches, text, maybe try deep learning. So, so um, we build this toolkit called MXNet, which is currently actually uh, already great at adopting AWS. Um, so this is a system that we build that reflects all the philosophies that we have actually also in Actiboost, in a sense that we want the system to be scalable, we want, to, we want it to be flexible, and we want to be modular so that it can port, it, it, it can greatly port to any of the existing production systems that you have. So I think flexibility is one of the most important things that MXNet emphasizes. So normally if you look at existing deep learning systems, you get two kind of programming paradigms. So if you look at a system like TensorFlow or Ciano, you get this declarative type programming like SQL. You declare what you want to compute, you feed it to the system, the system is a black box that optimizes the computation for you, and it gives you a result. This is great for engineers where, who want to optimize their task. However, this is kind of like a black box to researchers who want to explore great details of, of, the, of the experiments. So there are other type of system that's called imperative system where you, you program and the, the code as cute as you go, you can interact with, uh, interact with the code like system like PyTorch and, uh, and uh, uh, NumPy is this type of system. So, um, the current system is, is have a, this great property that you can you can utilize this black box. You can get to entire computational graph and you can optimize for it. So it gives you a great chance for optimization. Imperial programs give you the great chance for flexibility. Most of the existing deep learning systems only adopts one paradigm. Like TensorFlow goes for full declarative, PyTorch goes for full imperative. So in a match that we think these two paradigms are very useful and want to get best of both the worlds. So what we do is that we have a unified interface that supports both a declarative API that allows you to declare the computations and the, and the imperative API that allows you to declare arrays and uh, do those computations as if they are numpy arrays. By mixing those two APIs together, you can have you can you can have a researchers doing flexible explorations using the imperative API while doing the heavy lifting job in the declarative API, so that. Uh, in practice, it gives you better product productivity as well as the as well as the efficiency in terms of programming. So, being flexible is important. Another very important thing is you want to be able to scale your computations to to different workloads, and that's exactly one of the reasons that we build Actibus, and we we follow the same philosophy in MX that. Um, one of the things about being so scalable nowadays is that you don't only want to utilize one CPU devices. You want, you want to utilize different devices like GPUs or even customized hardware. And, uh, and you, you don't want to utilize only one of them. You want to utilize all the possible resources that you have. This brings a problem because um, you, want, you want to utilize, you are essentially having a problem of doing parallel programming here. For example, you want to program your neural nets on four GPUs. Um, it's kind of a very tedious job if you want to do it in a very low level. The reason is that in order to get a very optimized program, you need to program, you need to do parallel, parallel programming that allows your computation to interleave with those communication with, with between nodes. 
And, and this kind of like a communication, computation, asynchronous programming pattern, it's very hard to do in, in, a, in a manual manner. And I would say, although as a, as a great engineer, you might want to do it for just for fun, but, but it's, it's better to build a system that handles this problem for you. So what we build is that we have a, a synchronous scheduler that allows that, 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 that that's an ab abstraction that takes arbitrary imperative programs and it checks the dependencies of those data flows. For example, in here, you have three expressions and there's a, there's a diamond style dependencies between, between, the three, between those expressions. So in this example, the computation of C and D is going to be, is going to run in parallel, although the program is, is written in a pure serial manner. By using this automatic parallelization engine, what you can do in MXNet is that you can write code that, that essentially is essentially zero, but MXNet automatically parallelizes it for you in multiple GPUs. And it, it, it can utilize all those uh, optimizations like overlap of computation and communications and other things effectively so that you can write efficient distributed program or multi-GPU program in, in a serial manner. And this is great, and by having this, uh, by having this distributed scheduling engines, we can scale MXNet to multiple GPUs and even multiple machines. For example, this is a scaling figure that we get from AWS. Essentially, you can scale MXNet to up to 200 GPUs and still get uh, weekly, uh, weekly uh, scaling in, in this plot. Of course, being able to scale with faster, scale faster is great. How about scaling to bigger models? In a sense that if you think about deep learning today, many of the applications are fundamentally kept by the hardware resources that you have. So one of the interesting things that, for example, if you take a look at state-of-art uh, niche classification model, uh, ResNet 200 is the, state, is the, is the previous state-of-art of image classification model. And the reason that the, the creator chose 200 layers is because that's the number of layers you can fit in a Titan X car. So if you, if you choose more layers, you run out of memory. So, so basically, your, your creativity is bounded by the resources that's given to you. That's not good. So we want to be able to scale to even bigger models. And in order to do that, we have, a, we have advanced optimization that automatically allocates and calculates the memory layout for you so that it can do sharing as much as possible. But even with this optimization, you can, you can put like maybe 220 and not too much because there are dependencies between those forward and backward, backward computations. And you need to keep track or, or you have to keep those memories in the, in the, in the GRAM. So what do you do? So we, what we do is that we will trade the computation for memory. So, so essentially what we'll do is that in the forward backward computation space, we wouldn't record every piece of the intermediate result to calculate, back, to calculate the gradient. Instead, we'll drop some of the result off and recompute those in a, in a, in a backward pass. By, by arranging those recomputations smartly, you can get a, a memory complexity that is uh, sublinear, which is the which is which is like it's not linear to the to the number of layers, but a square root of number of, number of layers. So by using this technique, basically, we can fit, for example, 1,000 layers of ResNet in one Titan chart, where before you can only fit 200 layers. And actually, you can find that our our memory cost curve with respect to number of layers is have a smaller slope. This is a log log plot, which means that the slope represents the, the, the polynomial factor that you have on the, on the, with respect to number of layers. So you can train bigger models with MXNet uh, by, by those automatic graph optimization tricks that we build. Okay, again, one of uh, being flexible and, uh, and scalable is great, but one of the most important thing as we, the lessons we learned from XGBoost, that we always want to be modular and we always, always want to be able to port the system to the existing environment that you have and, um, and make it run effectively. So if we think about the future, about future, about deep learning, future of deep learning systems, I think, in my opinion, the future of deep learning systems is going to be more and more heterogeneous because you have so many different workloads and different needs. If you want to build a mobile serving system, maybe you don't even need a front end. You can just have a evaluation engine that takes the existing operators and evaluates the, the, the workloads on the mobile phones. If you want to build some BV system like MXNet, you will need 
things like uh, computational graphs, code generators, operators, and other stuff. If you only want to be an intuitive engine, there are some components that you don't need. So, what we re but we don't want to rebuild each piece of this system from scratch. So what we do instead is that we modulize the components in the deep learning system so that we can reuse some of them. Um, so, so there are basically two philosophies that you can use to build a system. Um, you, can, you can build an entire platform that solves all the problems. Um, or you build a module that works well with the existing open source ecosystem. And you can stitch some of, the, some of them together to get, a, get an effective piece. So we will go for Unix philosophy here, as we did for ActiveD. So this is a new component in MXI called NNVM that, that represents the intermediate graph uh, computation op and optimization. You can take, basically, it, you can, it, it's an intermediate layer that allows you to represent intermediate computations and it's already in MXI right now. Uh, the difference is that with NNVMs, you can represent optimizations like memory allocations and, and uh, uh, device allocations in a, in a platform agnostic way. For example, we build another system called TinyFlow, which is, uh, which is a kind of replication of, of TensorFlow in 1,000 lines uh, on top of NNVM. So this gives you more, more possibilities to, to support more front end and back end. One of the challenges in here in building a common graph representation for different frameworks is that the deep learning have, have very different needs uh, than existing systems. Basically, if you want to think about deep learning workload, you, you will need to be able to add new operators like, uh, because new operators pop up every day. So that's one need that you must support. On the other hand, we find there are more and more optimizations that you want to do. For example, you want to do the memory optimization that I mentioned before. You might want to do something like code generations. Uh, you want to ship your code to, to FPGA so you have some code that's specific to FPGAs. So you want to be able to, but all those new things will require new op optimization paths. So you want to be able to also be flexible to add new optimization passes. Supporting either of them is actually easy, and you have, you have existing systems that, that, that support either of them, but it's very hard to support all of them. So, for example, for example, if you take a look at existing systems, traditional deep learning system like CAFE or TensorFlow tends to, it's easy to add new operators because you have a predefined interface for operators. But it's very hard to add new optimization passes. On the other hand, if you take a, like, take a look at compiler system like LLVMs, it's very easy to add optimization passes, but the set of primitives that you have is kind of predefined, pre, pre and then you are restricted to that set of primitives. So with NVM, we, we try to decouple both and try to make adding new operator and adding new adding new optimization path easy so that uh, it, it benefits MXNet when we add new optimizations and op operators easily. So this is already in MXNet, and uh, we have already set uh, a few set of predefined optimi optimization paths in NVM that we are actively using in the system. So you can find that this is like a more high level thing that you describe, computational graphs, and how you optimize computational graphs in an abstract way. There are still challenges, for example, how do, you, how do you port your code to different devices? Like MXNet currently supports CUDA. Uh, how do you support OpenCL devices? How do you support Apple? How do you support like iPhone? And the, these multiple backend problems still, still bothers our users, and we want to solve that problem as well. So this comes a work in progress pipeline that actually I'm currently actively working on with the MXNet team. So, we will, we will add a new layer of, of compilation, lowering pipeline below NVM. Um, with our current prototype, the, the new compilation pipeline is able to describe the high level computations in those low level IR. And we are, we are now able to lower into backends such as LVMs, Metal, which is the iPhone's GPU backend, OpenCL, which is the most, which support most of the mobile GPUs, as well as CUDA. And, uh, and the ARM and x86. So this is the, this is the future roadmap that we're currently working at in, in order to make the MXNet system being able to more modular and portable to even more platforms. So 
Um, I think uh, this kind of concludes what I'm talking about. I think the main takeaway is that we want to build systems that are flexible, scalable, and be able, to be, able to be able to build them so that they are modular and you can use them in many of the existing scenarios. Uh, if you are interested in the deep learning system things you, I talk about today, actually, I'm teaching a deep learning system course this quarter at the University of Washington. We have a course what, what website uh, that's not in the slide, so it's dlsys.washington.edu. Uh, uh, um, we have great homeworks that basically tell, that basically teaches you how to build a, a kind of standalone deep learning system from scratch. So you are more than encouraged to try it out. It's like uh, 1,000 line Python code. So uh, uh, it, I think it's very fun because the TA have put great effort into it. So this is the first course ever that, that, that teaches you how to build different systems. And, uh, and uh, it teaches the principle that we, that we talk about today. So with this, I will conclude my talk. And uh, uh, thanks very much. I will, I will have you take questions. <laughs> So I can take a few questions here. Yes. You have this interesting um, saying that uh, if you have half your data, you will de-base the system. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you use deep learning uh, system. I have a, I want to know your insights to three related questions. Yep. First, is the current uh, tree-based model using the tooling for half your data? Second, what prevents deep learning from doing well on half your data? And third, So I, I would say there's nothing preventing deep learning from working on tabular data. It's just that trees are easy to work on tabular data. For example, deep learning is inherently hard to tune. Um, it's, it's, it's even true for tabular data because you have more norms to tune. And uh, if, if, you are, if you are tuning a model carefully, I would say deep learning model is going to be on par with tree-based model. That's, that's what we see so far. Usually if you combine them, maybe you get better results. But usually, but usually you, you, you will need much more effort to tune the, the, tree, the deep learning model. For example, tree-based model have this nice property that is it's invariant to the input scale so that you don't need to rescale data. But if you want to deep, deep learning, you need to, you need to rescale your input very carefully in the, in the thing. So I would say there's nothing prevent deep learning to, to work on tabular data. Tree-based model have this very different nature from deep learning so that it wouldn't become obsolete. And uh, it's likely to work well in the future as well. Yeah. Yes. Um, I don't know if I understood or if you understood it, but um, is there a difference with any set that would be analogous to like TensorFlow Server? So, what do you think TensorFlow Server provides? Like, what, what's the feature in TensorFlow Server that you need? In like, it's just easy to wrap up a, a certain model at a given place. I see. So, yes. So th th that's kind of related to what, what we talked about in the last, in the sense that we want to support this multiple backend compilation flow that allows you to directly build a standalone module that you can port to any of the backend. 